Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with another Knife Makers Friday Five. Today, we're going to be a little bit Japanese sword centric. So in my Friday Fives, I basically just talk about things that are going on in the forge and uh, some of the videos I've been working on, stuff like that. So in a few minutes, I'm going to get around to answering a bunch of uh, viewer mail. Some of them are questions about Japanese swords, some aren't. But before that, let me go ahead and uh, make a few announcements about things that have been going on here and uh, some cool stuff that's upcoming. Uh, so the first thing that I want to mention is I did a video last week that I think is pretty cool about this bunch of knives that I've been working on. I have to be careful putting them back in there because they're all extremely sharp right now. These are what you call OEM or private label knives. So I'm, I'm doing these for Bear Trail Outfitters. And uh, so check out that video if you haven't already. It talks about the prototype that I did for the making of this production knife. So the idea behind private label knives is basically just that, um, you know, there are folks who want to make small batches of knives. They don't want to order 1,000 or 10,000 knives or whatever from China. Um, they want to have something that's American made, high quality, uh, small batch type uh, product. And they might be, uh, as in this case, outfit that sells outdoor gear. They might be, you know, martial artists. Uh, it could be a variety of different folks, even knife makers who want to have a production option to add to their um, custom options, whatever. So I do, I do that for a small number of folks. And uh, this gives you a little window into how that process works. So I've been working kind of fitfully on this project because, um, Sadly, my uh, mother-in-law died um, about three weeks ago, and so my wife and I have been just going back and forth uh, to North Carolina, uh, where she lived before she uh, passed away, and so I haven't done as many videos recently as I would like, so those of you who may have noticed that my production of, uh, of videos has kind of dropped off the last couple of months, should be picking back up now. Okay, so another thing that is really cool, some of y'all may recall that, I don't know, probably two or three years ago, I did uh, a video about a pair of documentary filmmakers who were shooting a smelt that I was doing here and did a little interview with me. Their documentary series, it's a three-part documentary series, has come out. It came out a few months ago, but now it's available on uh, Amazon, so for the price of six pack of micro brew beer or whatever you can watch this documentary series which i think is really interesting so what's the sun's shadow about it's just a documentary about american sword makers and people who are in sort of allied crafts like um sword polishing so there are interviews with um michael bell um howard clark josiah boomershine um, Chris Osborne, Ted Tenold, Tobin Threadgill, uh, me, of course, and a whole bunch of other guys. I, I can't remember everybody uh, offhand, but uh, really, really nice piece of work. So I, I hope you'll uh, take the opportunity to check it out. It's on Amazon. I'll have a link in the uh, description for it. Okay, so first question here is from a, a viewer named William Richards. Um, Hey there, Walter. I was hoping to pick your brain on the Soshu Kitai style. I was curious to know what you think about the optimal thicknesses are for the different layers in relationship to each other. Okay, so um, in order to answer this, uh, it helps to have some visuals. So I'm going to go run over next door and uh, or into the my other little office over here. I've got a whiteboard and I can draw some pictures and, and give some illustrations of my somewhat vague answer to this question. Okay, so here's the basic issue. Japanese swords were constructed from several different layers of steels that had different hardness. And at least in theory, the idea is that by doing this, you would have a tough, resilient piece in the middle and then a hard uh, piece with good edge holding uh, and good cutting ability on the cutting edge. 
But there are a whole bunch of different ways that these were forge welded together, that the billets were constructed to create different kinds of um, guitar or kitai is what they're called, which are you know, basically these different construction techniques. So the question here was specifically about soshu kitai, but uh, I'll show a couple of different things. So if here's the sword, so it could be just homogeneous, so it's just one kind of steel. You could also have it so that this in here is a softer steel. Um, you could also have it so that There'd be sort of a jacket here of softer material and a harder steel in the middle. This is called sanmai, which just means three piece. Um, yet another han sanmai, half three piece, works like this. So these would be the soft pieces and this would be the hard section. Uh, and then there's, uh, I'll do one more over here. Soshu, which supposedly, I believe, was invented by Masamune, who's a very famous uh, swordsmith. Um, the way it works is it has seven pieces that are all um, that are all forge welded together. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe there's even something like that. I can't, I can't even remember. Anyway, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right. Okay. So seven pieces. Um, so the question is how thick should these be relative to each other? Okay, before I talk about that, I want to talk about the wisdom of doing any of these things. The theory, again, is that you had softer parts. It could be in the middle. This is called a kobuse. Um, or you could have ones where the jacket is softer as in these others, sanmai, hansanmai, soshu, and so, so forth. Uh, but there's a, also a possible um, reason for these things, these complicated welding uh, schemes, which is that the stuff, the hard stuff, the stuff you want on the cutting edge, that steel was very hard to make, very, very expensive. And so if you could use some slightly less expensive steel in some of the other parts of the sword, there might be some value in that. The answer to why these were done is lost in the mists of time. Um, if you follow Japanese swords, you'll know that in the Japanese sword connoisseur world, the answer is always the, the thing that valorizes the swords the most. Is it really true? That's a whole different question. Uh, it could well be that some of these were done primarily to save money. We don't really know, but now we live in today where you can buy uh, high quality steel for very little money. The steel is by far the smallest cost in making a sword. It's all labor. So, you know, the question is, is there some good reason to do a complicated, um, welding scheme like this at all? And I personally believe that the answer is no. I, you know, used to make, I, I'm not as active in the sword making realm anymore, but I used to make these, you know, homogeneous steels. You know, I made folded steels, I made all kinds of different things, but the, the, the swords that I was typically selling to martial artists to use in the most brutal environments, cutting giant pieces of bamboo and all that sort of thing. This was what I typically used. It's hardened on the edge here and the back is soft because of the way you heat treat it. It doesn't have anything to do 
with the actual steel constituents. It's just a heat treating function. And so all of these are gonna be heat treated in that same way so that this edge piece is gonna be hard. And the rest of it's gonna be soft. So you can do all this other complicated stuff, but my view is that it's only marginally useful from a functional standpoint, especially with modern steels. So, is it really all that important how thick or thin these various parts are in these other sorts of welding schemes? I'm not really sure that it is. I mean, the main thing is that, you know, just as a, an aesthetic thing, you don't want so little of the skin steel that let's say you did a caboose welded thing that part of that central core pokes out of the uh, of the skin steel. To me, that's really the main reason that you would want to be concerned about the relative proportions that you're using of these various steels. So to answer your question, you know how important and what proportions should these be? I don't really think it's all that important. Uh, if you're going to do it this way, the main, main, main thing is you just want that edge to be exposed and, you know, that whatever steel you're using that's going to form your edge, you want that to be the good stuff. What happens with this other stuff? Probably not that important. Um, again, you, you, you want to make sure that whatever your core steel is, especially if you're using, say, a mild steel there, or, you know, whatever it might be, if it's somehow noticeably different from the steels you're using on the exterior, you just want to make damn sure that that stuff is not going to stick out. And so I wouldn't use too much of that core steel. Um, but honestly, I wouldn't make a sword that way anyway. I've never made one that way, and I ain't going to. So does, does it mean that this whole thing is just kind of dumb in a modern sword? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, it's really just, it's, it's an aesthetic thing. And so that's kind of my main point here is that if you, if you want one of these more complicated welding schemes, at least to me, given my experience and whatever, I would say that the rationale for doing these more complicated welding schemes is because it seems cool which is the whole reason for having uh, swords to begin with. Nobody's gonna be in a sword fight in this day and age. So the reason that you, that you buy one is because it has aesthetic purposes or you, know, it, you, just, you think it's cool. So that's, you know, that's my main point is there's no reason not to do it this way. It's just there's no reason to do it for functional purposes. And therefore that leaves you room to kind of do it in any way that will just work without screwing up the sword. Okay, so viewer question from Dave Bishop. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but the gist of it is that um, he's taken up knife making. He is uh, on a fixed income and just doesn't have tons of money to throw at, uh, at tools. So anyway, uh, he talks about, uh, he's, he's looking to get a new um, a new grinder. He said, uh, the cheapest 2x42 I can find is the buck tool. Um, I know there'll th be things that I need to do, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, he said, the thing seems to run awfully fast. Is there a cheap device I can buy that will allow for a slower speed? So um, the first question about speed. Typically with machine tools and grinders and stuff like that, you have to use something called a variable frequency device or a VFD to slow them down. There are some kinds of motors that you can slow down by just decreasing, uh, by just decreasing the voltage uh, to the motor and they'll just slow down. Just out of curiosity, I actually have a buck tool, one of the ones that he, uh, the, the uh, grinder that he referenced here. And I just thought, well, let me just, put a rheostat on there and crank down the voltage and just see if I can make that particular motor run slowly? The answer is no. 
Um, sadly, uh, that will not work with that uh, machine. And that is a pretty cheap machine, so um, if it doesn't work for that, I doubt you're gonna find any uh, grinders that you can do that to. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm not really aware of any solutions that are cheaper than installing a VFD on your grinder. Unfortunately, there's not a, an easy answer to that. I will say though, I'm not an electric motor expert, so any of you guys who know a good solution to this, by all means, leave, uh, leave a comment. Okay, so next thing that he asks about, uh, the other issue regards heat treating. Because of my living situation, I have to heat treat with a propane torch. I'd like to differentially uh, heat treat using um, by, by leaving the spine soft and gradually go down the blade with the cutting edge completely hardened. Is there a way to do that? Um, so with high carbon steels, it is possible to torch harden um, blades. There's some well-known smiths who use this method routinely. You know, you're not gonna be able to do it with just a little propane burns matic type torch from Home Depot. You're gonna need something a little more powerful than that. You know, I've done this with a big, it's basically like an oxyacetylene type torch, but made for propane. So it's possible to do it, but you do still need a lot of heat to do it. And little cheapo forges from Amazon are gonna actually be cheaper than a nice big oxypropane um, rig. That said, what you're trying to do is raise the edge temperature to you know, roughly a red color, and you can do this on a number of different kinds of carbon steels from 01 and 1084 to, I mean, just a whole host of different kinds of steel and you just quench it. And what you quench it into uh, is gonna depend on the type of steel. One more little follow-up on the, uh, the question about edge quenching. Basically, how you quench is dependent on the type of steel you use. If you use 1095, I mean, can you quench it in Parks 50, which is a very fast quenching oil? Yes, and especially for an edge quench, that'll usually work just fine. Can you do it in canola oil? Yeah, probably, but that wouldn't be ideal as far as I'm concerned. But the whole subject of what kinds of medium to quench into and um, you know how hot they should be, and I mean, it's super, super complicated. So unfortunately, it's a, it's a little bit too much to bite off in this particular um, venue here. Finally, he, he wanted to ask about uh, cutting oil for, um, for drilling holes and tangs and stuff like that. Uh, I personally like using tap magic or these, I mean, there's several different kinds of tapping fluid that are these real thick, waxy types. Um, and I don't think the brand matters all that much. It's much more important just that you use something than that, you know, you use the absolutely perfect uh, material and just a little background on that um, you know anytime you're drilling holes anytime you're doing almost any kind of cutting operation milling lathes anything like that uh, you're gonna get more tool life by using some kind of lubricant and there are lubricants that are specifically made for almost every kind of cutting application and so tapping fluids are specifically for running taps but also for uh, drilling. So very handy to have one of these around, you know, five bucks or something like that, and it'll last you literally years. All right, guys, well, thanks for watching, and I uh, hope you learned something, and see you back next week. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com